So hello and welcome everyone to the Stanford Precision Health for Ethnic and Racial Equity or SPHERE uh, Transdisciplinary Collaborative Center's Precision Health Equity in Primary Care Seminar Series. Today is actually the second seminar in a four um, in a four part series, and our focus today is going to be germline screening for cancer and cardiovascular disease, uh, primarily thinking about minority populations. Can go to the next slide, please. Great, so my name is Lisa Goldman Rosas. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health, as well as the Department of Medicine in their Division of Primary Care and Population Health. And I am lucky enough to be um, your moderator today. I'm here uh, joined by my co-host, uh, Dr. Sean David. Um, he is the Program Director and Translational Science Outcomes Research Network, uh, Vice Chair for Research, Department of Family Medicine at the North Shore University Health System. He's also Clinical Professor of Family Medicine at the University of Chicago School of Medicine. So um, our goals today for the um, hour that we have together are first to characterize evidence-based genetic screening tests for cardiovascular disease and cancer and their utility for prevention in primary care. We're thinking specifically about primary care on the front lines um, of addressing health disparities or promoting health equity. Uh, we're also going to be uh, describing barriers to genetic screening for patients from minority communities and the relevance of variation in genetic architecture across populations. All right, you can go to the next slide. As a reminder, this is accredited for one hour um, of CME. Um, it's geared towards primary care providers again, especially those serving diverse communities, as well as academic partners in a, um, interested in the promotion of health equity. Um, so be sure and, and get your credit. Next slide. Wonderful. So today's introduction, uh, today's uh, agenda, I'll provide some introductions for each speaker. I'd like you to go ahead and put your questions in the chat while the speakers are, um, are talking. We'll be monitoring that chat and I hope you liberally use that Q&A. Um, we will have a, um, uh, a presentation by each speaker, and then we'll have a chance to have a discussion together where we'll facilitate um, the questions that you submit in the chat. And then we'll close and remind you about our um, next two seminars coming up. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I will present each speaker um, as they, um, in order. Um, and we are gonna start with Dr. Ewan Ashley. So Dr. Ashley is Associate Dean and Professor of Medicine and Genetics at Stanford University. Um, over the last decade, his team has focused on the application of the human genome to medicine. He was recognized by the Obama White House for his contributions to personalized medicine and awarded the American Heart Association Medal of Honor for Genomic and Precision Medicine. Um, very exciting, his book, The Genome Odyssey, Medical Mysteries and the Incredible Quest to Solve Them was released just this year. Um, he's also co-founded several, um, several companies and shared with us that um, he's the father to three young Americans, which you'll note in his accent in just a minute why that is relevant. Um, in his spare time, he likes to um, try and figure out American football. Um, he plays music. And then importantly, his other research interest is on the health benefits of, um, of whiskey, I understand. So uh, without any taking any more time, Dr. Ashley, I'd like to pass it over to you. Well, thanks so much, uh, Lisa and Sean. Thanks so much for the uh, invitation to be here and to join such an auspicious panel, really uh, colleagues and friends, to, and to talk about such an important topic. Uh, so uh, let's uh, jump straight in. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a professor in, in medicine and genetics. I'm a, I'm a cardiologist here, actually talking to you from our cardiology clinic uh, and uh, somewhere where we do a lot of genetic testing, predominantly for Mendelian uh, rare genetic disease. But I'm going to focus a little bit more because of our interest today in, in uh, primary uh, care and preventive genomics on uh, the new world of polygenic and integrated risk scores. So I always like to, to, to remind any general audience that these are the major causes of, of death in our society, heart disease and cancer, obviously the big two. But I think what we also need to remember and that this is an interesting graph because it shows what people are actually interested in as, as a cause of death. And, and when you look and, and see that, you see the Google searches 
demonstrate that people are much more worried about cancer than they are worried about heart disease. But also uh, at the bottom end, you can see uh, terrorism, homicide, and suicide become uh, important uh, in Google searching. If you then look at what the press actually talks about, this is the New York Times here on the left and the Guardian from the UK on the right, you can see that they are broadly overrepresented. And while cancer still has a, a significant yellow box there, heart disease among the reporting is at a similar kind of level to, the, to that at which people uh, Google. So uh, it's certainly an, at some level an under-recognized uh, cause of death uh, in our society. Um, and this is the case, not just in the US, of course, but, but globally, 18 million people a year, greater than 75% of, of deaths are in low and middle income countries. So this is not just a, a developed country phenomenon. Uh, and most of those deaths are due to heart attack and stroke. So, so not too many surprises, I imagine, for anyone in the audience there. But of course, for our topic today, uh, are we representing the diversity of the world when we start to think about precision medicine, especially in, uh, in the future? And so as a reminder, uh, the, the world in which most of our genetic testing has happened to date has been that for Mendelian disease. And for uh, in cardiology, we're thinking about things like familial hypercholesterolemia, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy that, that leads to heart transplant, heart failure, uh, and death. Um, and when we are testing for that, we're usually testing a panel of genes, we're sequencing them. And then in order to decide if a variant is truly causative of those rare Mendelian diseases, we're looking to, to big databases. And, and the, the, the two that we go to most commonly, and, and the one single that we look at the most often is this one called Nomad. Uh, it's gone through a few iterations over time and name changes. Um, but when we think about the diversity as represented in the world, just above, and then in comparison with these populations as that you can see down here, or perhaps more simply over with this other uh, NHLBI top med consortium, which is 150,000 genomes, you can see they both tell the same picture, which is that although we've made some progress, uh, you know, in, in earlier days in, in genetics, I've shown graphs where uh, this particular piece of the pie, for example, where individuals of Af African ancestry are represented was, was much, much smaller. Uh, and we still are underrepresenting by a long way people of Asian ancestry, uh, as you can see from the chart here and from the numbers to the top right. We, we, we have made some progress, not nearly enough, but we've made some progress and it's nice to see that progress. We just really need to focus on this uh, a great deal more. Because when we're thinking about what, what is a Mendelian variant, does it truly cause these rare diseases? What we rely on is population frequencies. And so that population frequency needs to represent the diversity of the world. And that's obviously the, the topic uh, that is a theme as we move forward and talk a little bit uh, focused on the idea of genomics as prevention. Because I think while the last 10, maybe 15, even 20 years, we've been focused on these rare diseases and the ability to bring genetics to the, to the bedside of our, our patients, in the future, we are really very interested in whether we can use genomics to prevent disease. And, and this it, thinking about this takes us into the realm of polygenic scores and the idea of an architecture of disease that relies less on a single variant that's explaining the whole condition or most of it uh, over to a world where we're really looking at potentially up to millions of variants of much smaller individual effect contributing to cause an, an overall predisposition to disease. And that architecture, that complex disease architecture is what underlies coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, and, and many of the other common uh, cardiac uh, conditions that we all treat. Um, and so uh, this is a short perspective, if you're interested in a, in a short read that we published a, a year or two ago when Josh Knowles and I finally came to the conclusion that we were really there. It was really time to, to look at these scores and start to use them into, in, into preventive care because cardiovascular disease is very much, those diseases I just mentioned, they're, they're about half genetic and about half environmental. And almost all our focus right now is on quantifying the environmental component because that's obviously changeable, but the overall risk picture is informed by both and by both kind of equally. And just that, to put that in perspective, here's a graph where we show the explanatory value of each of these risk factors, the C index and area under the curve. And these individual risk factors shown here on the x-axis, the classic ones of smoking, diabetes, BMI, they're not particularly high, uh, in fact, C indices. In fact, if, if you put them all together, though, you get this green bar here, which is significantly higher. Uh, if you take a genetic risk score, it's better than any of the individual ones. But of course, the best prediction of all comes when you put the nature and nurture together, uh, adding the conventional risk factors with uh, a genetic risk component. 
And that's something that is essentially kind of embedded into our guidelines, the idea that we should use it, whatever factors we can to make the best risk prediction possible in order to decide what we should do for patients. And in particular, down here number nine, one of the biggest things we could do for patients is, is lower their cholesterol. Predominantly at the moment, that's through statins, but there are many new medications coming along, including injectables and biologics that can uh, reduce those even further. In fact, my friend of mine, said Kathy Reeson from Harvard, had showed uh, in last week's uh, Nature that he could use base editing, uh, so CRISPR engineering, to reduce the PCSK9 uh, function in, in order to uh, essentially permanently lower, this is in primates so far, non-human primates, but they're moving forward into, into clinical trials in a way that you could permanently alter uh, cholesterol. So we're definitely entering a new world. And we've, we've worked as well in this area to show that an integrated score where you take uh, both clinical and uh, genetic risk factors uh, can, do, can do better than individual risk factors. It's a complicated graph, but just look at the black and you'll see the same thing essentially as the graph I, I showed you before. Um, but for our topic today, the most important thing uh, we're coming to is, is whether we can do that across different segments of society. Just before we get to that, I, I added this one extra graph in here that I'd forgotten about. If you look at how this compares uh, to by, by doing a kind of prospective trial, you can actually go back because genetics doesn't change and look at if you had applied this risk factor in the past, can we look at incident coronary artery disease? So a lot of the time we're saying, well, maybe we need a trial to start today and look 10 years into the future. But because genetic risk scores don't change, we can go 10 years in the past and then look forward to see if we used our study from today, our, our integrated score, would we have predicted people who actually got heart attacks. And, and in fact, that's what this shows. So if you take the traditional score and our uh, integrated score and they agree, that's this line, and obviously much, much more in higher incidence of CAD, if they agree that the risk was lower, this is this green line. But for the places where the traditional score and the integrated score disagree, this is where uh, we follow them. And you can see that the integrated score basically performs exactly as, as expected. We had up classified the, the group in purple and down, down classified the group in, in blue. So even in a sort of prospective way, you could see that this actually uh, works. And if you did this across uh, you know, many, many countries and many diseases even, uh, there could be a significant cost saving and significant life saved here in the US, more than 2,400 deaths by this model, which is a cautious augment only management. We're not taking away anything. We're only adding it to those who are up classified. But yes, to the most important question, the one we're really here for, uh, can these scores be better? And how well do they perform across the diverse parts of, of society? So first of all, ancestry is what we normally come to think of. And this is a very damning graph from an H-genetics paper from 2019, demonstrating just the overwhelming preponderance of European ancestry individuals in the GWAS data used to develop the polygenic risk scores. And this is changing, uh, but this is where it was in 2019. And we need to do a lot better. It's also worth mentioning that it's not just the ancestry, although most of the focus is on that. It's, it's also socioeconomic status and age and sex. Basically, the training data, data matters. And the training data across all segments of society, it needs to reflect all segments of society. And that's making sure that we have sex and gender equity, that we have ancestry equity, and that we have socioeconomic status equity. It really matters to the final ability to predict that the training data reflects the underlying populations in which we want, want to do that. But where are we today? Are we at the point where we need to say, well, we just need more data, we can't yet use these, or uh, is there some benefit? And that's what we attempted to look at here. This was a publication just last month, and it looks at the reclassification index, which is essentially, do we upclassify people uh, appropriately, and how many do we classify, and, and does that change across ethnicity? And we were actually somewhat reassured and actually quite buoyed by these findings in that Although there are large error bars, obviously, for the less represented groups, and we need to narrow those, the overall net reclassification was actually pretty stable across these uh, different groups from these different studies. So our overall conclusion at this point is that if we can do better prediction, even if it's not quite as powerful in groups that are underrepresented in the training data, then it's in, in cardiology, at least, it's time to, to give that better risk prediction to everyone. And one of the reasons is that the people who are underrepresented in the genetic studies are also underrepresented in our healthcare system. And they suffer disproportionately from heart disease. So they have more to gain from even a small improvement in our ability to predict who's most at risk. And this is what uh, is shown here. And that there are many other data points that could demonstrate this, but obviously 
underrepresented in genetic studies often means underrepresented in our healthcare system. And so we don't want to increase the disparity by introducing something that uh, is, is only, it is, we don't want to increase disparity by, by depriving one group of, of better prediction if it, if it truly has uh, performance. We just need to be transparent about where it is and work to make it even better yet. So there's some guidelines coming for this. I'm sure Alison and others may, may talk about this. Uh, in relation to cancer, of course, polygenic scores affect Mendelian disease uh, as well as uh, being there. But the future is, is multivariate. This is a study we did 10 years ago where we thought of a future where there were genomes for everyone. And uh, we thought about the, the possibility of incorporating pharmacogenomics, some conversations with Sean from many years ago, uh, thinking about polygenic risk scores and, of course, the Mendelian panels. And now we just introduced at Stanford two months ago a whole genome sequencing backbone for all our genetic testing on, on the cardiovascular side so that we can do these panels kind of in silico from the backbone of the whole genome, but also add in polygenic risk scores and pharmacogenomics and update them as our, as our scores get better. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, Lisa, thanks for mentioning the book at the beginning. If anyone's interested in patient stories in this general domain, then there's a few of them in there and you'd be happy to, to, to take a look. At. And, uh, if, if not, then it's very good for propping up laptops as well, I found this book. <laughs> thanks for coming today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate what you shared. And I think um, I, I see one question and I, I promise we will get to that during the q and I'm going to pass it over now to Dr. Kirian. Um, I'd like to introduce her first. So Dr. Kirian is a um, professor of medicine and oncology um, and also a colleague of mine in epidemiology and population health. She's also the director um, of the Women's Clinical Cancer Genetics Program um, here in the School of Medicine. Her research focuses on identification of women with elevated breast and gynecological uh, cancer risk and on the development and evaluation of novel techniques, especially for early cancer detection and risk reduction, which is why we've invited her here today. Um, as director of the Stanford Women's Clinical Cancer Genetics Program, her practice centers on women at high risk of breast and gynecologic cancers. Uh, she's also the leader of our population sciences program here at the Stanford Cancer Institute, and she serves as the associate division chief for academic affairs in the Stanford Oncology Division. She is widely published, uh, widely funded, um, and I'm really excited to have her here today um, to, to share her presentation. And I think you are going to share your slides. Absolutely. Uh, right, Alison? Okay, I am. great. I'll pass I it am. over to you. Well, thank you so much. That was a very kind introduction. Let's see if I can just get this to share in the view. Can everyone see my slides okay? Looks great. Wonderful. Again, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here today, and it really is an honor to be on this panel. And I'm also very pleased to have had Dr. Ashley give such an excellent talk beforehand. I think a lot of the themes that we discuss have interesting similarities and differences. So thrilled to be able to talk about that today. So thinking about cancer, some really simple basic things. So in cancer, stage is very tightly correlated with survival, right? And stage is just the anatomic burden. How much cancer is there in a person's body? How far has it spread? And this is a figure that I like because I think it makes it pretty clear. This happens to be breast cancer, but it really could be almost anything in terms of the cancers we treat. This is 10 year relative survival, zero to 100%. And this is the stage of cancer from stage zero, which is non-invasive to stage stage four, which obviously is disseminated at diagnosis. And I think it's pretty obvious where we'd rather be diagnosed and certainly makes the case for early detection, finding cancer as early as we possibly can. And so I wanna just illustrate what that looks like on a global level. These are data from the World Health Organization. And this again is breast cancer. Sorry, you'll see a lot of breast cancer examples because that's what I treat, but really a lot of it is applicable throughout the common cancers. This is a figure that shows the incidence of breast cancer. So how common are cases in different places? And the darker color means more common, the lighter is less so. So as we know, breast cancer really tends to be a disease of well-resourced populations and settings, right? So we see North America, we see Western Europe, up, we see Australia being heavily represented in terms of incidence of cancer. But now look at mortality. This is mortality. And so what you see for mortality looks a bit different, right? So these countries that had very high incidence are not the darkest in color here for mortality, right? So there is a difference. And that has a lot to do with screening, 
early detection and what happens when you find cancer early versus late. Look here at Africa, these patients did not have such a high chance of getting cancer on the prior figure, but unfortunately their death rates are high. And so this is all about the relation between knowing about risk ahead of time and being able to do good screening and prevention. And so with those figures in mind, I like to think in terms of this framework about our opportunities to reduce cancer deaths. So we see here examples of a normal slide of breast tissue. Basically, these are the ductal areas, and this is the supporting tissue, the stroma. This is malignant breast tissue, where you can see these cells have begun to invade all over and really not to stay within their area anymore. This is the bone scan of a patient who unfortunately has had distant cancer spread from her breast to her bones. And at this point, cancer is no longer curable in nearly all cases, unfortunately, and proceeds on to death far too soon. In the early decades of treating cancer, most of the action was here, finding out unfortunately through distant cancer spread by symptoms like bone pain and doing everything we could, but not being able to cure. Over the last several decades, there's been tremendous progress in both early detection, so finding it before it spreads, finding it often before it's symptomatic, and treating it effectively when we do. And so in so many ways, breast cancer has been a success story there, but so have lots of other cancers as well, lymphoma, leukemia to some extent, colon cancer, all of these have, have done better, cervical cancer, in that sort of a scheme. And so ideally, what we would really do would be to move backward a step, right, and so intervene just at this early process of transformation here or pick people who are very likely to go down that road. And so that really should be the point of genetic testing for cancer risk. Can we figure out who needs what kind of prevention and get it to them accordingly? And again, get them enough, but not too much. And I think too much tends to be more of a concern with cancer than perhaps we see with cardiovascular disease. So what are the genes that are actionable in cancer care? This is a summary of the guidelines of various different organizations, American Cancer Society, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, American Society of Clinical Oncology, all of them kind of put together that name specific genes and say, when you have a pathogenic variant, and here we're talking about Mendelian inheritance. So you're born with a deleterious change that basically makes a non-functional protein from inherited from one parent, not sex linked. When you have one of those in one of these genes, here's what the guidelines say you should do based on good evidence, right? And so there's a set where instead of just mammogram alone, we should screen women every year with breast magnetic resonance imaging. Here are those. There's a set where we should do more frequent colonoscopy or endoscopy for GI cancer screening, and they're here. There are several for which we should consider or even recommend risk-reducing surgery. And here's what I mean about too much, right? So this is irreversible, it's a big deal. Sometimes it's the right thing to do, but we better be sure. So again, mastectomy, salpingo-oophorectomy, hysterectomy, et cetera. And those are the interventions we have right now. There are medications that can reduce some cancer risks, such as tamoxifen. I won't get deeply into those today for a number of reasons, but I'm happy to talk about them if questions arise. So what about race and ethnicity? So what we know so far is that when you look at populations and look at the prevalence of genetic pathogenic variants of mutations, I'm gonna call them for simplicity, for example, in BRCA1, BRCA2, and some of the other breast ovarian cancer genes, the prevalence is the same across race and ethnicity, whatever race you are. Basically five to 10% of breast cancer patients, 16 to 20% of ovarian cancer patients across racial and ethnic groups have one of these important findings. It may vary a little bit in distribution. Some are more common in one versus another, largely due to founder mutations that are enriched in certain populations just historically, but really the prevalence is otherwise the same. However, the access to genetic testing and to good care, of course, is not equally distributed, right, as we know only too well. And that can certainly be a problem in terms of getting patients what they need. Now, you heard from Dr. Ashley, and this was extremely helpful as a setup, thank you very much, about the lack of diversity in some of the reference data sets in terms of different populations. And unfortunately, most of our data on the normal sequence of genes, right, comes from white European populations. And so when you're sequencing a gene, particularly one you don't know very well, I'm just going to pick one out of a hat. Let's pick PALB2, which is a gene we've started testing lately. And the normal sequence was defined in whites. 
when you sequence in populations that aren't tested as much, you're going to get a lot of findings that are almost certainly normal variation for those populations, but we don't know for sure. And so what happens is that those get labeled variants of uncertain significance or VUS, more common as you can see in patients who weren't the original reference genome and who since then haven't had equal access to testing. And the problem is if people respond inappropriately to those variants of uncertain significance, and that, as we see, can be a concern. So I want to give you a real world example of what happens when we start doing this kind of genetic testing, which, by the way, I do. I think it's important. I'm all for it. But just illustrating the kinds of things we have to think about. This is a study we recently did of patients with breast cancer in the population based SEER registry. Uh, so more than 180,000 patients looking at genetic testing over the last several years when things have changed a lot. And so if you were tested in 2013, you were probably tested for two genes that we we knew a lot about BRCA1 and BRCA2, and only a relatively small proportion back then got tested for a whole lot of other genes, right? All the genes I showed you in that table, plus increasingly, we're seeing panels go beyond that 50 or so to, you know, 150 onward and onward. And so by 2017, what we saw was that you were very, very likely to get tested for a lot of genes if you got tested at all. And so it was interesting to see by race ethnicity what happened. So looking at pathogenic variants or meaningful results, a change that we want to know about, honestly, they didn't change very much. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons was because we started testing patients with lower prior probability, people who didn't have as much family history because testing got cheaper. So that's one of the reasons you don't see a big bump there. It did increase a bit when you look in specific categories. But what you really see is this change in the rate of these variants of uncertain signal significance, right? So starting in 2013, going up to 2017, and you also see a gap opening up in terms of race ethnicity, right? So the lowest rate of these pesky variants in non-Hispanic whites, the highest rates, as you see, interestingly, in Asians, right? We saw that Asians are underrepresented in a lot of these genome data sets, but also in Blacks, which of course is a big problem. And so it's something that we need to be aware of when we test. And so we know that there are challenges in implementation of good genetic risk evaluation and management. One of the issues is in terms of referral and clinician encouragement of patients to test. This is a study we published a few years ago where we looked again at a population-based data set from the statewide cancer registry and saw women who were indicated for testing who clearly had a family history should be tested. Only half of them actually got tested. And when we asked them why, why didn't you test? I thought it was going to be cost, but cost has come way down. It turns out the most common reason was my doctor didn't recommend it. Okay, so that's a problem. As doctors, we have power and we need to know that and think about what we're doing. And I'll just share that there were certainly racial disparities here in terms of who was getting recommended more and who wasn't. And so again, what about this VUS or variant of uncertain significance problem? This is work by one of my wonderful colleagues, Susan Domchak, where she was looking at patients who had various genetic testing results that were a bit less familiar. So not BRCA1 and 2, but other breast and ovarian cancer genes, some of them with a real ovarian cancer risk, some not so much, and asking them if they had their ovaries removed preventively and whether a doctor recommended it. And so they looked at patients who had these variants of uncertain significance that should not make anybody change care in three of these genes, ATM, CHECK2, and PALB2, as well as patients with pathogenic or real mutations in these genes. Let me say the only one of them for which it should cross your mind as a doctor to recommend taking out ovaries is this last category of PALB2 be too pathogenic. For none of the others should you even be talking about it. And yet here's what we see, right? So we see a lot of situations where it's being recommended by clinicians and even more where they're discussing it as sort of a good option. So I think, again, not that we want to so fear about this, but just to be clear that people do sometimes get hold of the wrong end of the stick. And so it's important to think about what we're doing there. What do we do about these variants of uncertain significance? There are certainly evolving techniques to classify better. This is just a timeline from one of the commercial laboratories of when they started doing BRCA1 and 2 testing in the mid 90s up until today, adding all these different genes and their different algorithms and approaches to reclassification. There was another study um, by someone using, again, this laboratory database and looking just at BRCA1 and 2 and finding that over time from 2006 to 2016, 
reclassification to saying, no, this is not uncertain, it's not harmful, it's just a benign variant for that population, the time has gone way down, it's gotten much faster. So that's good. But as we counter that by testing more and more genes, right, we just have to think about how to keep up. And I'll just say also that people are exploring strategies about how to get better at testing patients who need testing and aren't. One of them is this strategy of mainstreaming, so teaching doctors and nurses to basically act like genetic counselors and get the test ordered. And so we know that that actually can be quite good. You see getting up to approaching one uh, in some certain clinics where this can be done, but understand these are very well-resourced clinics. And again, that may not work for every setting. Telemedicine, right, fruits of the COVID pandemic may be helpful in some ways in terms of gaining access. So that's being explored. And situations where you embed a genetic counselor in primary care or oncology practices. But again, you need enough genetic counselors if you're going to do that. So I'll just conclude and say that this is an incredibly interesting and exciting time. We have the chance to do good for patients on a much larger scale than we ever did. But we have to be aware of disparities in the clinical validity of results in terms of variants of uncertain significance, in terms of genetics referral and testing, so who is accessing appropriate risk evaluation, and certainly and perhaps most importantly in results management, making sure we're not removing body parts unnecessarily and fitting the right intervention to the right patient. So I'll stop here and thank you very much. Incredibly informative, uh, Dr. Curry, and thank you so much. And it's a wonderful segue to the next presentation. Um, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Dr. Oguchi Nakwacha. Uh, he actually is in primary care and has done quite a bit of work in his um, primary care setting um, to, uh, to provide genetic uh, testing to patients, even in very low resource settings. Um, so Dr. Nkwacha is a family physician. He's currently the chief medical officer at Clinica de Salud down in the Salinas Valley uh, here in Monterey County. It's a federally qualified health center. And um, he practices uh, in the clinic about 40% of the time. So he has lots of experience with doing this. Um, he is also the director of the, um, the institutional review board um, at Clinica de Salud. Uh, let's see, he received his medical degree from the University of Utah, and he did his family medicine internship and residency at Ventura uh, County Medical Center. So he has a lot of experience in safety net settings. Um, he, uh, he also um, is a data scientist, has a master's degree in predictive analytics from Northwestern, um, where he gets some of his interest in, in collaborating on research with us here at Stanford. Um, and I am just really excited uh, to hear from him about his experience of implementing genetic testing in a federally qualified health center um, in Monterey County, which, as many of you know, serves a primarily migrant farm worker population. Um, and I believe uh, someone is going to share your slides for you, Dr. Nakwacha, and I will pass it off to you. Thank you very much, Health, for that introduction. I think it cost me like two dollars for you to say all that for me. <laughs> Thank you. I feel really honored to be here, uh, to be speaking uh, in, the, uh, in this group and um, the excellent speakers we've had so far, uh, Dr. Ashley and his presentation on uh, cardiovascular um, aspects of our genetic testing and Dr. Kurian. And I, I just feel like my talk so dovetails into Dr. Kurian's that I should probably not just say anything except to say, well, okay, that's the plebeian version of her talk. You know, so please uh, proceed with the next slide. <clears throat> so that's my declaration. I don't have any conflict of interest in this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so the paradigm I wanted to bring up for primary care physicians and uh, that uh, that's really necessary to understand where we're going and how you can set your mind to doing what we need to do, which is to uh, genetic uh, 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 screening, cancer screening. That cancer is a genetic disease. We have the experts here and they can talk, uh, talk to that. Uh, they can speak to that, but uh, everything I've seen so far, and it's a, a new paradigm for a primary care person in the trenches like me, I'm sure that uh, the specialists have all known this all along, but just to, to, to have that mental set that cancer is really a genetic disease. Now, next slide, please. And being a genetic disease, 
uh, to for when you talk about prevention, then we have to look for genetic screening uh, as a tool for, for these cancers. And I think Dr. Kurian put it up best that saying we're not now looking for, we're not just looking for early detection. She said, we're looking for early warning. And that's really a, a, a good place to be. We're looking for early warning. We're not waiting for early detection. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but we have some issues in primary care uh, when it comes to uh, genetic screening for cancers. And, and there's uh, one of those issues is some barriers that we get from asking the question, are there practical interventions that are available right now in case you do genetic screening and you find something, you say something positive, what can you do about it? Uh, what if you find that as a VUS, you know, variants of uh, unknown significance, like the Korean pointed out several times, what, what can you do for that? I say practicing physician, those are some of the things that you want to look at before you even begin to offer this test or begin to participate in it. And the clear answer there is yes, because if we do genetic uh, screen, cancer screening and we find out something that's earlier and more proactive screening, uh, like colonoscopy, mammography, ultrasound, breast MRI perhaps can be offered. You know, this can be tailored. So rather than going with what the general guideline says, you can tailor this to the particular individual. And that uh, Dr. Korean mentioned uh, uh, some of those things and so did Dr. Ashley. And we can also offer earlier a more, uh, uh, can also offer earlier uh, preventive medications. And uh, again, uh, uh, Dr. Korean mentioned tamoxifen. Counseling on lifestyle modification now could have a context. So it's not just generally throwing it, okay, you need to wait or you need to lose weight or you need to stop smoking. We can actually show you that, you know, look, this is what we screened, what we got out of your screening. And this is the reason why you really, really have to do this above it all things. So it becomes, you put those uh, uh, counseling uh, points within the context of uh, what the particular uh, 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 disease prediction risk that the, that the person has. And you can see that these are targeted to specific elements of the cancerous tissue. And I think uh, Dr. Ashley brought up a lot of that, so did Dr. Curry. And I'm just going to be referencing you too because you said the stage so well. Now, it's not so much that now we are looking at uh, breast cancer. Now you're going down and looking at the genes and the mutations and the products of uh, the gene uh, expression products. You're now looking at them as a way to do this uh, early signal detection, early warning that we can get. And it's now targeted to the individual uh, person. For example, if we heard breast cancer before, you'd just be thinking about women. But if it's part of the uh, HPOC syndrome, then men also have a, a predisposed to that kind of cancer. And um, so it's now, it's just the individual that you're looking at. And where this also may come into play is, we're now talking about minorities, we're now talking about ethnicities, and we're now talking about races. But underlying all that are common genes and common gen genetic mutations. I think the discrepancy that was pointed out here is that, uh, variants of unknown significance, VUSs. If we had more, more contribution to the gene uh, pool studies research from uh, other ethnicities, then those will, uh, will probably be uh, better able to get a handle on those. But for the most part, you know, for those uh, mutations that we know what they're doing, it doesn't really matter what your gender is. It does what what your uh, what your race is, what the ethnicity is. So this is a, becomes a leveling, uh, a, a playground leveling uh, instrument uh, tool. Okay. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the the other issues of barriers I have to do with patients. You know, patient expense. That's a huge thing. At one time, in one talk, we said, okay, the, these are no longer too expensive, but in the mind of the patient or even the physician, you look at the genetic text, you're thinking thousands of dollars, that's what I would have guessed, only to find out that for $200, you can get a panel. But then I was reminded that even $200, 
maybe a lot of money for our patients. You know, so we need to think about that. There's also a lot of anxiety. What will they find? What if they find something? What even they, if they don't find anything? How am I going to feel about that? What's my family going to feel like? If I get, uh, if there's a positive finding, will, will I not become ostracized by the insurance companies where this becomes a pre-existing uh, condition that uh, will make me uninsurable? And will this lead to unnecessary testing and treatments? And as uh, uh, physicians, we know that the more tests we do, the more likely you're gonna find uh, false positives and false negatives. And that, you know, we kind of have to pursue this and follow through and see what we get. Privacy and personal information security concerns are always there. Uh, this, this is data, you know, all this stuff goes somewhere and that there's no secure, 100% uh, secure uh, database or repository out there. They can always be broken into. And so people get uh, concerned about that and we can see that. Next slide, please. Yeah, as physicians, uh, frankly, we share the same concerns with the patient, expense for the patient, unnecessary testing and procedures. And there's no uniform clinical guidelines out there. And uh, I was looking at the guidelines that um, uh, Dr. Ashley put up there and for cardiovascular initial guidelines don't even mention anything about uh, uh, genomic testing, but I'm sure that's gonna come when they upgrade that. Now, uh, the point is pointed out by uh, um, Dr. Kurian again, the, the genetic risk assessment skills, you know, those are barriers for most physicians. Genetic risk counseling, those are barriers. We don't have possess some of those skills, most of those skills, unless we go for extra training. And genetic test ordering and resource management skills. And uh, again, Dr. Korean did such a great job of showing us the complexity. So how would you, how would you expect a, a uh, primary care person in the trenches to master all this. Look at the panels that are coming up. When you get VOCs, how do you interpret them? The interpretation 10 years ago is not the same interpretation now. So those are real, real, uh, really uh, very significant barriers. And then a, a, a primary care physician has to deal with uh, the relatives of their patients. Their patient is the index there and uh, that you have to uh, recommend for their families to do something. How do you pass on that recommendation? How do you know that recommendation is carried out? And how would you feel as a primary care physician if you learned later that you know this particular uh, condition for which you advised the, the family to get tested, they did not get tested and somebody comes down with it. So these things really not at you. The current knowledge gap between genetic science and technology and application in primary care in uh, uh, primary care clinical practice, that's a huge barrier. Look at all the things that we've talked about, the specialists have talked about, Dr. Ashley is talking about GWAs and uh, uh, Dr. Kurian is talking about all these other things, VUSs, panels of tests. And that for a primary care physician to be concerned and worried about those things, you know, in order to do, uh, to do a particular function is really a huge barrier. And next slide, please. <clears throat> but we can overcome those barriers. There's the good gaps in knowledge can be closed and oncogenics information uh, gap can be closed. And this is practically what you're doing now. We have 35 people on here and hopefully most of them will be primary care physicians. So they're getting their knowledge and the idea. And just even the essential thing, the seminal fact that, you know, Cancer is a genetics disease. If you can just get that in your head and in your minds and help at a direct and facilitate what you do, that will be a great thing. And then improve those skills in genetic counseling, in genetic testing, the ordering of panels, which ones you need to order and how and how you can interpret them. Increasing access, so so that we have our consultants. Well, given this talk, I see we have consultants that are accessible to us. We do a lot of business with Stanford, Stanford, and I'm sure that the other consultancies that we can use. So it would just be like any other uh, condition where you send patients to con uh, to consultants uh, for uh, help to take care of themselves, and we need to have access to genetics uh, resources 
talks like this, making them um, easier to understand and bringing them down to practical levels. Even something like patient assistance programs, uh, when it comes to paying for their uh, test, and, and uh, I noticed that some of the companies have scholarships that they can, uh, 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 they can use, uh, patients can use to apply there. And then please get us in universal guidelines for genetic cancer screening. And how does go to UPSP, UPSP task force, you know? All these are different organizations with their different ones. And if you're a primary care physician, you don't necessarily go to those organizations. But if it goes to the USPS, a preventive services task force, if it lands there, good, that gets your attention and you're more likely to use it. But do remember the paradigm shift. Cancer is a genetic disease and genetic screening is indicated and necessary practice. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So in conclusion, uh, for my fellow primary care physicians out there, please always remember, cancer is a genetic disease. Cancer genetic, genetic screening is logical, it's effective, it's affordable, and it's really indicated. We're not just gonna stop at uh, the, the common hereditary cancer syndromes. I think I can foresee that uh, sometime in the future where every cancer, you know, just have to we just have to go in and, and check and see what the uh, uh, mutations are in everybody. And it's not going to be targeted towards ethnicities or minorities, this or that. We all have those same basic gen uh, genomes, the human genome. You go there and look for the mutations. And, and once you find the mutation, then you can apply it to the individual. That's the individualized and personalized aspect of this. The precision part is that you can precisely find the um, uh, find the mutation, even though you may not be able to, um, to interpret it like VUSs. So, and cancer genetic screening guidelines are available. If you are determined, you can find a guideline today, even today that you can use, or uh, well, maybe not in a cardiovascular disease, but Dr. Ashley is working on that with his team. And um, effective interventions are available. Uh, if, you, if we find something, there's always something that we can do. And so with that, I can say that uh, a primary care is always best positioned for e effective screening, uh, population screening for anything. And uh, the, here again, we're placed in that role. Thank you for, for the audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Nkwacha, for providing uh, the perspective of a primary care provider. And um, I'm really pleased now to pass it over to um, our patient advocate, Lori Campos Collier. Uh, so she works here at Stanford, um, previously at Stanford Healthcare and now at Stanford University in Government Affairs. Um, and uh, she also previously was for 12 years, the director of policy for Community Health Partnership, which is a consortium of federally qualified health centers uh, here in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Um, so aside from that um, inside information about healthcare and primary care, especially in federally qualified health centers, we've asked her to come here today to share her perspective as a patient. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, Ms. Collier will share her information. Um, she um, will let you know she is a four-time cancer survivor, and she serves as a patient advocate with many organizations, including the National Cancer Institute, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and others. And I want to be sure to give her enough time and leave a little time for questions. So I will pass it over to you. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks, everyone, for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, I'm going to share my experience as a cancer patient with you. And that story begins with my mom and dad. So this is a picture of Rudy and Lita Campos. Uh, little did we know that two years after this photo, my father would not be with us. Uh, my father was diagnosed with colon cancer when he was in his 30s, and he passed away at 51. Six years after he was diagnosed, I was diagnosed with endometrial cancer stage 3C. And when I looked at Dr. Curian's slide of stage 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I see how uh, fortunate I am to, to be here today. And so I was at a meeting. Uh, American Cancer Society meeting where Dr. George Fisher, who is at Stanford, did 
a presentation on Lynch syndrome. I hadn't heard about Lynch syndrome before. I thought, well, this would be interesting. It's about colon cancer. And he showed this chart, mom and dad, dad has colon cancer, son and daughter, daughter has endometrial cancer and son has colon cancer. Uh, a few years after I was diagnosed with endometrial cancer, my brother was diagnosed with colon cancer. So when I saw this chart, I was immediately taken aback because what I was thinking of was my family in the next slide. So mom and dad, dad has colon cancer, son and daughter, son has colon cancer, and I have endometrial cancer uh, in 2016, had colon cancer in 2017, had melanoma, and then uh, recurrences of the colon cancer. So this was very shocking to me as I'm picturing that pedigree and, I, and I'm thinking about my family. So I went to my oncologist and I said, I think this is what I have. So I did undergo genetic testing and it was determined that I have Lynch syndrome, which is a genetic condition that increases a patient's risk of colon cancer and many other cancers like endometrial cancer, like skin cancer, stomach cancer, brain, liver cancer. And so having that information was really scary for me. Uh, I was given the information in a room with a genetic counselor, and I wasn't thinking about myself. All I could think about was my family. And that's really something that I would like to share with physicians is that when you give that result, that genetic result, you have to imagine the patient's family sitting right next to them. Because I'm not thinking about myself so much as I'm thinking about my mom. I'm thinking about my brother. I'm thinking about my niece and nephew as I learned that my niece and nephew had a 50% chance of getting Lynch syndrome because my brother was also tested and he also has Lynch syndrome. So that's definitely one thing to consider. And when you are Filipino, like we are, uh, it's a little more challenging because you don't want to tell anyone that you have this genetic condition. And for my mom, it was very difficult. She lost my dad, her son and daughter both had cancer. And now my friends weren't, my mom's friends weren't coming by as often as they used to. Uh, maybe there was something that she had done or our family was cursed. So be mindful when you're giving a genetic result to a person that you're actually talking to their whole family, their present family and their future family. So I have, um, my first diagnosis was 24 years ago and my life has changed because now that my physicians know that I have Lynch syndrome, I have regular appointments, I have regular screenings to prevent the next cancer. So all of the work that you are all doing to address this in primary care is very important. I do remember uh, I was invited to present my experience to the president's cancer panel. I was one of seven from California and there was a woman from Alaska who presented and you could tell that she was very ill. And she said that she had been trying to go to the doctor. She noticed the lump in Alaska trying to get to a primary care doc, just tell him that she wasn't feeling well. She tried and tried and just could not access care. So she went without and she continued to take care of her family and she continued to work. But when I saw her at the meeting with the President's Cancer Panel and saw that she was very ill, it was because she could not get access to care. And the one thing that she said that I'll never forget is she said that access to primary health care is a huge indicator of cancer survival. So if we're talking about genetics in primary care, you first have to have access to primary care. And then in order to serve minority populations, you have to have genetic counselors and physicians who look like us. And I do see that changing. But we have many, many health disparities to address. But access to primary care and then access to genetic testing as a preventative measure for not just the patient, but for the entire family is, is amazing. And we should be able to offer that. We're not quite there yet. 
Um, but I'm hopeful because of the people on this panel, because there are opportunities to include patient advocates in presentations like this. I'm hopeful that that will change and that if my nephew needs genetic counseling, he will get it and he will get the resources he needs. And I say my nephew because we just found out that my niece tested negative for Lynch syndrome, which is something that I have worried about from the day she was born. So thank you for inviting me here today and for sharing my story. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. Ms. Collier, thank you so much for sharing your story. This uh, panel would not be complete without the patient's perspective. And uh, thank you for your bravery in, in sharing what, sound, what can be very difficult. We really appreciate it. So we have a limited time for questions. I'm hoping the panelists can stay on a little bit longer um, so that we can keep the recording going and, and, and get to all of the questions. We have wonderful ones. The first question is, does ability to predict risk necessarily mean ability to predict that any given intervention will reduce that risk? And I'm gonna pass that first to Dr. Ashley and I'd also like to hear the other panelists, um, especially yours, Dr. Curian, um, after that. Dr. Ashley, are you there? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. I'm uh, happy to answer that, a great question. And, and the short answer is uh, no, <laughs> that it's really mm -hmm. a different phenomenon. But of course, the more risk you have, the more benefit there is potentially from any intervention that can reduce that risk. Um, for, for some interventions, we expect them to improve to some degree the uh, risk profile in, in almost everyone. Things like exercise and diet are so fundamental that there's almost certainly benefit for everyone. And importantly, benefit not just against the environmental aspect of the risk, risk, but also the genetic aspect of the risk. So you really can use changes in lifestyle to reduce your risk from both genes and from environment. So that's really important uh, to know. Um, but thinking about individual level responses, is, is it really you just, just put your, your finger on, on the pulse there of, of what's most important going forward. We need to start to study how we can also predict benefit. And, and some of that comes down to pharmacogenomics. We can do that with the same kind of data. We're definitely looking to introduce that in Stanford as well. There are some variants that help decide, for example, how likely you are, help predict how likely you are to have a benefit from statins. And so that's an, also an enlarging field. So. Thanks, Dr. Ashley. And in the area of cancer, especially breast cancer, Dr. Korean, um, perhaps it would be relevant to answer that question as well. Yeah, I think it's a compelling question. And I'll say we're in a situation where we've been testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2 for 25 years. We've learned a lot about what works. We've learned that prophylactic mastectomy appears to increase survival, as does prophylactic oophorectomy, right, which is important. We've learned that MRI-based breast screening almost certainly increases survival. It certainly improves early detection. And we know a little bit about some of the medications that work better in terms of PARP inhibitors, which were just in the news because they were shown to be better for treatment and they may be moving into the prevention setting. I think the question is, do we now have to redo all these studies every time we find a new breast cancer gene, right? We're not gonna be able to do that. It's not possible. And so I think a lot of the time what we're doing is by analogy, but it has been contentious and tricky, particularly for things like treatments, medications, where you're thinking about molecular mechanisms. So I think we're more comfortable with generalizing from screening. I think we're more comfortable with saying when we've proven an ovarian cancer risk is high, you take the ovaries out, but it is tricky and it's, it's an ongoing question. Great, thank you. Um, there's an excellent question um, submitted in the Q&A as well. The question is, how can we bring more minority groups into our studies collecting genetic data to increase diversity of our global library? Um, perhaps thinking about some of those slides that were shown um, early on about the predominance of European ancestry patients who are in, included in the, um, in the uh, research databases. And so I'm actually gonna ask you, Ms. Collier, what do you think can be done to engage more diverse patients um, to participate in precision medicine or genetic research? You know, it's, it's the question that uh, the several national committees that I sit on, we're, we're all asking that same question. How do we do that? And, and I'll tell you, when I was first diagnosed, my oncologist told me, we don't have any data on young women like you or your ethnicity on how to treat you. We have data on white women who are older. So we're gonna try that and that, and we're gonna hope that that, that that works. 
so that when he told me that, I thought, why isn't there any more data? And as I became more active as a patient advocate and met people around the country and understanding the hesitancy in wanting to participate, uh, part of it is because the support for after you find out. Um, the, part of it is, is cost. Part of it is really not understanding what to do with that information. Um, right now for cancer patients, there, we never know, like, do we go back to primary care when we're done with our treatment or do we stay with our oncologist? You know, how do we now navigate our care? Well, imagine adding a genetic condition to that. And then the question is, well, now I may get this down the line. How, how do I navigate this? How do, how, do I, how do I do this? And so oftentimes, in, in especially in underserved communities, there are other priorities. And so it will take outreach and education, serious outreach and education. Over the years that I've been working in healthcare, I've heard this over and over again. And I'm hoping that what we've seen with COVID and the disparities around COVID and now seeing a, a, an interest and a commitment to health equity, that that thing will change. So I, I, I'm hopeful about that. Your everlasting hope is is noted, <laughs> and 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 I think we all share that. Um, I want to ask one more question and perhaps get the input of each panelist. And and Dr. Nakwacha, we'll start with you. Um, what I'm interested in knowing is what research or dissemination efforts do you think you would prioritize to advance um, equity through the lens of precision medicine or precision health. Um, Dr. Nakwacha, putting you on the spot, but wondering from a primary care perspective, what kind of research would inform your practice um, of being able to offer genetic testing um, in primary care, especially in the, um, the clinic that you work in? Okay, I think some of that has been mentioned that we, we, could be, we need to find out from the people, from the patients and persons, what their barriers are, you know. I, I believe it was the current that put up a slide as to what people are thinking as the as the barriers to, that are preventing them uh, from uh, coming in. Also, need we need to uh, think we need to put in a lot of research into uh, educating and disseminating the information and narrowing the gaps, you know, between knowledge, information, and technology of. of uh, genomics and oncogenomics and, and make sure that primary care physicians know that. And the other area that covers other things too is that we really need to find research that we can pass the results on and teach people that genetics is about biology, it's not about race. We can't conflate up genetics with race. I hear all these ethnic groups, minority groups, it's really not about that. In the past, that's how we've classified medicine and diseases, you know, but genetics, we share the same genes and mutations are common, you know, they, those happen on an individual basis if they happen to the gonad gonadal cells and you pass them on, but if, if not, then this is just for you as an individual. So we really need to do some research in that area so that we can bring out the information and make sure the people know that, you know, genetics is an individual thing. It has nothing to do with race or ethnicity. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and Dr. Curran or, or, or Dr. Ashley, would you like to think about what research you would prioritize moving forward in order to address health equity? I thought that was a wonderful answer from Dr. Nakocha, and, and I was really moved by, by you know, the talk that Ms. Collier gave and, and just hearing about what's going on in the community with Dr. Nakocha was also wonderful. So I, I think so much of this is really implementation on the ground, right? We know a lot about the science, we're learning more and we need to know more about the basic genetics, but a lot of it really is these questions about barriers. Why can't we get through in certain ways? What do we need to teach doctors and nurses that are useful skills that can be deployed in the clinic to to get patients what they need. I think a lot of those are really key. And I, I think family members are a huge issue. And I'm so glad Ms. Collier brought that up. I'm actually involved now in a randomized trial of ways to reach family members and help them get tested. But I think some of these questions really need to be studied further. Great. So a lot more about translating the research findings into practice through perhaps implementation science. I think Wonderful. So. Dr. Ashley. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely endorse everything that came before. I, I think the, the theme for me is that we need to come to where people are. I think it, traditionally this research has been done with an expectation on our part in our academic ivory tower that people will come to us. You know, many uh, studies are done by sticking up posters around campuses. I mean, you know, you, and you'll get the people who walk around campuses. We need to go to where the people who've been underrepresented are into their communities, the places where they spend time. Uh, digital, I think, is is actually very interesting because it really that the penetrance of, of mobile phones is is very high, and people find that very convenient. Um, we've been running for many years a study called My Heart Counts, uh, which initially was initiated with Apple, and so at the moment to date, I'm afraid to say, still only on the iOS system. But we're actually moving, thankfully, in the next few months to getting it onto Android, and that that's a, just by itself it will help us reach a much larger segment uh, of society. And because in particular, the differences in, in users uh, between those, even those two operating systems. So, so there's even some, some technical things like that that I think can help. But the general message I think is we need, we need to go to where people are, make it easier for them to join and stay engaged because they want to. I think across society, people want to help. They really want to help their fellow human by being part of a society that's been touched with, with people joining our studies for that reason. And I think if we do a bit more effort on our part, people will step forward and, and, and come together. Sounds like you share Ms. Collier's hope. Um, I would agree with that. And we'll let you, um, Laurie, have the last, the last word. What kind of research would you prioritize as a patient um, to advance health equity? Well, I, I really appreciate what everyone has said. And uh, picking up on with Dr. Ashley, I, yes, we need to go where people are. We need to be in their community and talk to them. But one step further from the, is so that they, they look like the community. We really need to find those scientists in, in their early stage or look at high school programs and try to recruit from the community. And to me, that would be the next step, go to the community and have people who look like them. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that incredibly important. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to my co-host, uh, Dr. David, to close this out and remind us of what the upcoming two seminars are in the series. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you, uh, Allison, Ewan, and, uh, and, and Lori, and Gucci for outstanding talks. So the next seminar is gonna be on June 17th on pharmacogenomics in underserved communities. And we will have uh, several speakers, including Dr. Latha Palaniapin from Stanford, uh, as well as Dr. Megan Mahoney uh, from Stanford as, and uh, Dr. Manoli Pereira from Northwestern, who will be presenting on a range of work from really bench to bedside and their experience in implementation. And the final uh, uh, seminar will be on June 24th, and that will be on polygenic risk scores in a primary scare screening setting. And this will build on some of the work presented by both speakers today. And so we encourage you, to, if, you've, if you have colleagues who've missed this, you can go to this link here and, uh, for a patient evaluation, but also the registration recordings are available on the website for the next two seminars. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we'll hope to see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.